Thanks for speaking to me today. Jeffrey, my pleasure. Okay. Thank you. As you know, we're living in a country with 10,000 commercials a year for food products and processed foods that are hypnotizing us to do things we would never do intuitively. And we know that all that marketing, if it's successful, destroys instinct and intuition. We're like walking customers. And then maybe we become overweight or develop a chronic disease. And unfortunately, we're still looking to the wisdom of the marketplace for what to do. And then enter, of course, the diet industry in terms like low cow, low carb, low fat, diet this, and a pharmaceutical industry looking for more and more customers. What are you doing? What could we all do in this nation to change that? Well, I, I feel like I'm not doing enough. And I, I guess really after 25 years of working to try and overcome exactly that, and, and, and by the way, Jeffrey, it's not just that the marketing itself is hypnotic. The products are essentially designed to be hypnotic too. I, I'm a fan of Michael Moss. Michael's a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, has a book called Salt, Sugar, Fat, mm -hmm. a new one uh, coming out called Hooked. And an excerpt from his book appeared as a New York Times Magazine cover story, The Extraordinary Science of Addictive Junk Food. So, you know, we can start out with hypnosis and then move into mm -hmm. addiction. But the point is the foods that are being peddled to us most aggressively are willfully engineered to be addictive or something like it uh, and, and, you know, really well engineered. I mean, these are teams of scientists who are using functional MRI machines to figure out what is it we have to do to food to maximize the number of calories it takes before people cry uncle, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes, I mean, every instinct, every native tendency is, is being overcome by clever marketing and the clever engineering of products. I have felt, as I, I've watched this play out over the span of my career, I'm not doing nearly enough. But it's, it's really hard to know how to fix it because we're talking about deep pockets and powerful interests, the pharmaceutical industry, the food industry, on and on it goes. So one thing that I think we need to do differently is prioritize solidarity. We need to get together. You know, I mean, all of us need to get, I mean, if, if we're health professionals, if we care about the human condition, we should be more concerned about getting the fundamental truths that we share across to the public than bickering with one another about the little areas of disagreement we may have. And frankly, scientists and public health people have been notoriously bad about that, and, and for an understandable reason. What makes you an expert is not the 90% of what you know that everybody else knows. It's the 10% where you're diving in and asking harder questions and not so sure. But if all we ever do when we're in the spotlight is talk about our areas of doubt and disagreement, the public thinks, well, th these guys don't know what to tell me, and they disagree with one another, and I don't know who to trust, so I'll just go back to eating double bacon cheeseburgers, what the heck, mm -hmm. and toaster pastries for breakfast, and running on Dunkin' and all that good stuff. So I, I've created an organization called the True Health Initiative, which is a global coalition of, of leading experts. Uh, right now, we're about 350 strong from 33 countries, and it's a who's who in medicine and public health and, and sustainability. And the beauty of it is that, for example, in the diet area, the expertise ranges from the world's leading authorities on the vegan diet mm. to the world's leading authorities on the paleo diet willing to stand up and be counted in public and say we agree much more than we disagree and the public deserves to know. So those kinds of things, I, I think we need new strategies. The, the, the other thing that we can all do, we can get outraged. I mean, we wring our hands in our culture about epidemic obesity and chronic disease, but we tolerate junk food willfully engineered for profit that's propagating obesity mm -hmm. and chronic disease. I mean, we're a, among a nation of loving parents and grandparents where is the righteous indignation? Where is the outrage? I mean, if, if we could come together as, as loving families and be the world's greatest special interest group, we could put a stop to it. And frankly, if not now, when? If not us who, it's overdue. Thank you. I want to ask another question. As a nation, we're a lot more sleep deprived than we were a generation ago, about an hour less from what I understand. Could you speak to the affect on sleep deprivation and weight gain? Really important. So, you know, for me, I, I, my, my recent uh, preoccupation with the concept of holism has, has run through the channel of lifestyle medicine. And, and I, I recently completed my tenure as president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and had to think from my perspective and the work that I've done and all the people I've met, what, what is that formula? What is lifestyle medicine? 
And I think it's feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love. Mm -hmm. Physical activity, feet, dietary patterns, forks, not holding tobacco products with our fingers, enough sleep, stress mitigation, strong social interactions. And each of these has a powerful impact on the other. If you're stressed, you can't sleep. If you can't sleep, you have no energy. If you have no energy, you can't exercise. If you don't exercise, you gain weight. If you gain weight, you sleep less well and around and around it goes. Sleep is profoundly important. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important in all sorts of interesting ways. I mean, for one thing, I think we all know when we're really tired, we're, we, we lack energy, we lack restraint, we're cranky, we may mm -hmm. want to eat something just to feel better, right? So just at the level of attitude, sleep affects us. But the other thing it does is plays a major role in our circadian rhythms. So there, there are well-established endocrinopathies of sleep deprivation, where you actually start to disrupt regulatory hormones from melatonin to growth hormone, mm -hmm. which in turn affect cortisol and ultimately insulin. So there's actually insulin resistance of sleep deprivation. I mean, effectively, the initiating problem is lack of quality sleep, but what you wind up with is a metabolic problem on the road to diabetes. Right. Really, really important. And then that, of course, affects both what you're inclined to eat and how much, and where those calories go, and, and then the problem can propagate itself, because if you're gaining weight from sleep deprivation, the weight gain will disrupt your hormones, make it harder to sleep. You may wind up with sleep apnea, mm -hmm. then you sleep even less, and everything gets right. Yeah, exactly right. Really important. So I understand, so the metabolism will slow down when you're sleep deprived, and then our appetite will increase, and that's where we're more inclined to reach for high glycemic starches later on in the afternoon to pick yourself up. I think that's what I meant to say. What you said? <laughs> I just said it differently. So we know that our teenagers are heavier than they were a generation ago, and I know you're particularly you know, concerned about teenage obesity. Our high schools in this nation are starting very early in the morning. They're starting at 8 o'clock in the morning. And the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended two and a half years ago that no school starts before 8.30. I'm particularly working on this issue with an organization called Start School Later, mm. advocating for high schools to start no earlier than 8.30. Some schools are starting in the 7 o'clock hour. So these kids, instead of getting the nine hours they need biologically, are showing up on the average with just under seven hours. Right. What do you think about that? Interesting notion. So I've looked into this. I've never made it my personal crusade. I have five children, and, and only the youngest of my kids now still qualifies. He's 17. Okay. All of his sisters uh, are now in their 20s. So they, they've, they've graduated out of this and, and moved beyond high school. But my 17-year-old son's a senior in high school. And absolutely, he loves to stay up late, hates getting up early. Uh, he's often a uh, you know, walking zombie when he's trying to get ready to school. And, and if he had a couple extra hours in the morning, it would be ideal. And of course, the system is such that the younger kids go to school later. And, and as they mature into that adolescent period where it's really normal for them to sleep in, right. they have to get up you know, before dawn to get ready for school. Now, th there, there are traditional reasons for that having to do with high school students working after school, mm -hmm. preserving those hours oh, yeah. and that sort of thing, right? So, so you know, there, there, there are, I think, some traditional reasons for justifying the current status quo and pushing back. But just speaking as a parent, so, you know, again, it's not something I, I've studied extensively, but I've watched all five of my kids go through it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you see that, that oh, yeah. it's oxymoronic in a sense, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it, it just, it's opposite the native inclinations of the kids. Um, you know, the little ones who are up early, you basically have to figure out what to do with them for a couple of hours before it's time for school. And the adolescents, you can't get out of bed with a crowbar. So, mm -hmm. yes, I, I support that. So the last thing I'd like to talk to you about is exercise, and specifically outdoor exercise and its impact on our lifestyle and well-being. I'm a nature lover. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my favorite recreation is riding my horse or, mm -hmm. or skiing. And it, it's robust, good exercise. Of course, it's more robust good exercise for my horse than it is for me, but, but still not bad for me. Um, but you know, it often takes me to really beautiful places and it's meditation. And, and one of the interesting things about the health promotion formula, it, you know, it sounds like you have to do all of these six things. Well, no. Uh, actually, you know, exercise and stress reduction could be the same thing. They are for me, right? I mean, I'm meditating when I'm on horseback and I'm in nature. I think outdoor exercise does that in particular, especially if you can be in a place that you really like to be. Then, of course, there's also the issue of sun exposure, mm -hmm. making vitamin D. You know, we, we spend our days covered in clothes and indoors, so unless we're taking vitamin D as a supplement, we're not getting enough. 
it's normal for vitamin D to be a hormone, not a vitamin. We're supposed to manufacture it from sunlight. So some sun exposure is part of the native human condition, and, and I think it's restorative. I think exposure to bright normal light is good for the eyes and good for eye development. There are all sorts of concerns about constant exposure to the light of con computer screens mm -hmm. being associated with deteriorating vision over time. Um, the contrast of indoor and outdoor light apparently is much healthier, you know, real light and dark. Um, and so, you know, I, I think you've got the opportunity to essentially meditate in, in a, the preferred cathedrals of nature, do your stress reduction, manufacture vitamin D, get your exercise in, ideally breathe in some good air, you know, do some deep breathing that, that's kind of um, amplified in a sense by the, the freshness of outdoor air. You know, I, I just think there's a whole wide array of advantages. And, and there are studies that look at things like nature deficiency syndrome. You know, Richard Luth. Yeah. yeah. In, that, in his book. That's right. And, Last Carl in the Woods. And, and I, you know, I think that's really quite profound because almost everything that we need, almost everything that is good for us, is good for us because it's part of the, the natural world we're adapted to. And certainly the natural world we're adapted to is a natural world. It's an outdoor world. And it, it stands to reason that walling that off so we no longer have access to it would come at a high cost. Thank you. I can tell you I want to get involved and help you. Good. Because it's my crusade too. Excellent. Appreciate Thanks so much. It. Thank you. My pleasure.